Good morning. Welcome to Refresh 2024. I'm going to teach today from Psalm, yeah, thank you, that seems so loud, from Psalm 87. I'll give you a second to turn there, and I'm going to go to a couple of other places, but you can stay in Psalm 87. I won't make you turn with me. Kelsey texted me, I guess in March, with this theme, All My Springs Are In You, and she sent me all the lyrics to a song that you're going to learn later by a friend of ours who we knew from Bible college in Hungary. That's where I met Kelsey years and years ago. My husband and I, with our first two children, went to the Bible college campus in Hungary, and she was a single lady there. And there was another guy there named Neil, and he wrote a song that you're going to learn later. But it's about all my springs being in the Lord. It's about all of our springs being in the Lord. So really, I'm here this morning to talk to you about a celebration. We're going to study all of Psalm 87, but it ends with singers and dancers saying together, all my springs are in you. So we read about this sort of census like a a recording of people who are going to be citizens of heaven. And then we see that they're celebrating. They're celebrating this citizenship and birthright that God's given them to be called one of his own, one of his own daughters. That'll be the personal application for us, won't it? Because we're all ladies. This is my favorite environment, by the way. I love a women's Bible study. I love a women's conference. So it is a great delight for me to be here. When I thought about refreshment, the first thought I had was a waterfall. You know, that kind of water that is from the melted snow on the mountaintop. Now, you guys have one of the most famous waterfalls in the world not far from here, right? No? Am I thinking about the wrong place? <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm living in Philadelphia now. We just have little waterfalls. But when that water falls on you, it's a refreshment a physical refreshment, but this morning we're here for a spiritual refreshment, aren't we? Looking to the Lord to teach us something new about himself, about his character. Let me talk to you for just a minute as I get started about inductive Bible study. Because when I read this psalm and this census that's being taken of God's people, it did not make sense to me that people would be celebrating with singing and dancing at the end. And so I thought, I don't want to teach the whole psalm. I'm just going to teach this theme verse and get out of there and go to some other passages. But my husband encouraged me, teach the whole psalm. So the first step for me was his office, and I took a commentary off the shelf written by Charles Spurgeon, who is way, way smarter than me. And I was really discouraged at the end. I thought, I don't understand anything he said. So I'm just going to teach this theme verse and get out of there. I don't want to teach the whole psalm. And my husband said, no, you need to teach the whole thing. And he's been talking to me about inductive Bible study for years. It's um, a three-step process where you would read a passage to make observations. You would read it again, asking the Lord for interpretation. And a third time, looking for personal application. I'm telling you this because this is the way I studied which will give you insight to why I'm teaching the way I'm teaching. But I'm, my testimony is that I was so blessed that he encouraged me and I listened to him and I'm going to teach the whole psalm. Because there really is so much rich, richness here that I couldn't see the first time I read through it. But it really does give us a reason and lead into this celebration where people are singing and dancing and saying, all my springs are in you. So if you don't have a resource for inductive Bible study, we can get you one. It's pretty easy to access and use. But when we read anything, right, the first thing we're asking is, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to my heart when I read this? What does the Holy Spirit want to say to us today? And he said a lot of things to me in the past couple of months, and I typed them out, and I'm prepared to tell you what he said to me. But I want to pray for you before we get started that he'll speak to you through this passage as well. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. We're trusting you. 
to teach us. We're trusting you to be our teacher. So I just pray that this time we've set apart for this piece, this portion of your word, will you bless it, Lord? Will you give us your spirit? Will you anoint us for the listening, for the speaking, for every detail? In Jesus' name, amen. I like to read the whole thing first, and then we'll break it up into a couple different sections. But the title I have in my Bible for Psalm 87 says, Glorious things of you are spoken. It says it is a psalm of the sons of Korah. It's written as a song. And I'm not going to sing it to you. I'm going to leave that to the Burke family. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God, Selah. So we're having more than one Selah this morning. Verse 4. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. For the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the people, this one was born there, Selah. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. So I'd like to look at verses 1 through 3, then 4 through 6, and finally, we'll talk about verse 7. To keep it in context, I'll say a couple of things about 85 and 86 as we lead into our study of Psalm 87. You may or may not want to write these things down, but Psalm 85 is about God's mercy and how he's brought them back from their exile in Babylon. He's brought them back into their land. And the general theme is that it speaks of forgiveness of sins and a mercy that his people don't deserve. Psalm 86 is about men chasing David, which you know is a recurring theme in the Psalms, but these men are trying to take his life. And it has a section in the middle where David's meditating on the greatness and the goodness of God, which is how we're going to end our time together. And before Psalm 86 is over, David is requesting help. God, will you rescue me from these men? And then it goes into Psalm 87, which is about a census that's being taken. But mostly glorious things are spoken of this place. This, this city of the Lord. Let's read verses one through three again, and then we'll, we'll look into it. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. So the first thing we see there is that it's a holy place. And it's holy because he lives there. If he didn't live there, it would just be a mountain with people and trees and dirt. So it's holy because he's established himself there. The second thing we see is that it's a city he founded. And listen carefully, listen up. The city of Zion becomes a metaphor for salvation throughout scripture. And I want you to listen to that and maybe write that down because it's the reason, it becomes the reason for verse seven. And that's the way we'll end our study together. The city of Zion, this idea that there's a city of God, this place on the physical earth called Jerusalem, becomes a metaphor for salvation. And it becomes the reason that people are singing and dancing and saying, all my springs are in you. So God found, he has a foundation for this city, comes out of his heart, and it's the foundation that provides stability. You think about that architecturally, it's going to be the foundation for which other structures are built on. But for us emotionally, we want to have our foundation rooted in the Lord, don't we? We want to have our foundation rooted in God's word. The psalm, or at least these first three verses, are sort of um, about the beauty of Zion, right? It's beautiful because it's holy, because he's the founder of it. And then it goes on to say that it's a chosen city of God. 
But in the scriptures, we see this said three different ways. And I might use all three of these words this morning. It's called Zion. It's also called the city of God. And it's also referred to as Jerusalem, which would be the physical place that we could find on a map today. But it's his favorite place. And it says here that he has a special love for it. He loves it more than all the other places Israel has lived. But that phrase could also mean that he loves it more than all the other towns of Israel. It's his favorite place. And he loves it, which is why he dwells there. We know he dwells there because it said it was a holy place, and it wouldn't be holy if he wasn't there. So the personal application for this part would be for us dwelling in him. Kelsey was just talking about how we need to be abiding in the Lord. I want to dwell. I want to find my place of safety and refuge in the Lord. You don't have to turn there, but you could write down this reference from Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Don't we want to dwell in the shadow of the Almighty? Don't we want to find ourselves hiding there? Have you ever found yourself wanting to hide from your circumstances, from people? Life is heavy and hard sometimes. You think about that, right? The shadow of the Almighty is a place where we can find safety and refuge. We want to dwell where he dwells. Zion, or Jerusalem, has glorious things spoken of it. And I want to give you kind of two categories to put those in. One is that glorious things happen there. And then the second, if I could look ahead, is that this city represents God himself. And that's where we'll go over this card. I'll talk to you a little bit about how that was born and why God put that on my heart. But glorious things are spoken of Zion because glorious things happened there. I'll put it in a couple of different categories. Glorious things were taught in Jerusalem. I don't have a reference for all of these examples, but I'm going to read them to you. The apostles served and were sent out from Jerusalem. I guess I'm just giving you examples, trying to prove to you this is a super special place, all right? The second thing would be that the church was born there on the day of Pentecost. Also, glorious worship was offered in Jerusalem. King Melchizedek reigned there. King David reigned there. This would be the place where Abraham had the faith to sacrifice his son. The temple was built there, the temple that was designed by David but built by Solomon. The priestly practices, all of the way the Levitical tribe sacrificed and worshipped, were established in Jerusalem, which leads us to Jesus taught there. He observed the feast there and practiced in the temple, but he was crucified there. He died there for us, for you and me. And he rose from the grave in that holy place. So we see that God chooses Jerusalem to do many great things. You see, we live in time and space. God is outside of that. But we live in time and space, so God has to create a place in our time, within our space, to do these wonderful things. So he puts this place on the surface of the earth he created, a place we can find on a map, and he gives it not only a history, but a future. Because in the future, Jesus is going to reign there for a thousand years with you and me if we're believers of Christ. But he also chooses it to be this physical geographic center for his kingdom on earth. And that's what I mean when I say that we're going to live and reign with him for a thousand years. So great things happen there, glorious worship, Glorious things were taught there, but then it's going to be established. It's going to have a future as well. The second category I wanted to give you is that this place, this city of God, represents who he is. So if you'll take a second to dig through your materials, there was a card given to you when you came in. 
So many people I've invested in this morning, and one of my friends in Philadelphia, when I shared with her what was on my heart, created this thing, this card, in these beautiful colors that Kelsey had already chosen. So on the front, there's this little pattern that lists a handful of the attributes of God, and she carefully selected scriptures on the back that would give us a biblical reference for why we say these things about who God is. And my heart was that if we had something laminated on cardstock and we could keep it in our Bibles, it would be a physical tool that we could pull out and use as a reminder for who God is. Because don't you find yourself forgetting how good God is, how able he is? We had a situation recently My husband and I traveled to a different place, and there was a medical issue that came up, and it could have kept us from coming here. And so, of course, we sent home, please pray for us. Um, We want to go to Kenya, and if this medical condition accelerates, we won't be able to go. And then when we came back from that place, and I was sitting at home studying, and I had this card, I thought, boy, I wish I had used that. Because this would have changed the way I looked at that problem. If in that moment of despair, I had thought about the love of God, about the goodness of God, about his ability to solve any of my problems, it would have changed the lens that I was looking through to see that problem. So my prayer is that you'll be able to pull this out and use it the same way that I wish I had, just to remind you of who God is. But I listed them all in my notes, and I want to read through this list thoughtfully and carefully, and I hope it ministers to you this morning. I think my list is a little bit longer than the ones on the card, but I'll just start at the top. God is able. He is our creator, He is wise, he is awesome, he is omnipotent, which means he is all-powerful, he is merciful, he is comforter, he is light, he is perfect, he is compassionate, he is counselor, he is love. And I just believed with all my heart when I printed this out that there would be a word as I was reading for every woman in here. So use whatever pronouns you want. He is my victor. He is omnipresent. He is my rock. He is my father, a good father. I think we're singing that song later. He is the truth. He is the life. He is just. You ever felt like God wasn't fair? I struggle with that. Like, how come they have and I don't have, or I have and they don't have? But he is just, perfectly just. He is a fortress, my shield, my friend. He is supreme. He is good. And I don't mean good in some things. I mean, he is altogether good. He is joy. Not he gives joy or he brings joy, because he does, but he is joy. He is holy. He is sovereign. He is immutable, which means he does not change. He is almighty, a miracle worker. He is hope. He is deliverer. And he is our savior. He's our savior because he died for us in this place that God chose for the center of his redemptive work. Let's look at verse four. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. So this is a celebration. God is boasting over the citizens of Zion. And Rahab, I'll just give you a little bit of interpretation the way I studied it. Rahab represents Egypt. Babylon, we know, is an enemy of God's people. They were in exile there. 
And so part of what God is saying here is that even among Israel's rivals, there's going to be people that know him. And I looked up this word know. I use a concordance when I study. Anybody in here use something called a Strong's concordance? Maybe there's other concordances out there. But it's easy to download and use on your phone. One of the first things when I got saved, within the first year, my, my pastor told me, get a concordance and get a Bible commentary. Now, this is before you could download a concordance onto your phone. I've been saved a long time. But he wanted me to learn to study God's word for myself. And I hope you'll learn to do that too. But so I looked it up. This word, this Hebrew word to know is yada, which had a lot of meanings, a lot, a lot of definitions, but I just took two. It means to be sure about. Do you want to be sure about your salvation? Do you want to be sure about God? Do you want to be sure that you know him? And the other definition I wanted to share with you was it could also mean coming into a relationship and seeking to know him better. But it gives us a prophetic picture of lost people being brought into the kingdom. But these aren't God's chosen people. This is Egypt and Babylon. These are God's enemies. These are lost souls being saved. Now, he also speaks of a few other peoples. Philistia is the Philistines. I don't have to tell you that they're enemies. Tyre and Cush represents like someplace in northern Africa. Some people say Ethiopia. Some people say Nubia. I'm not sure. But there's all these people groups who are not God's people, God's enemies. And it says here they're born there, which means there's going to be people grafted in. There's going to be Gentiles, the New Testament would call them. That's you and that's me. I wasn't born in Jerusalem. Let's look at five and six. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. For the Most High himself will establish her. And verse 6 says, the Lord records as he registers the people, this one was born there. So in verse 5, he says the same thing, but in a different way, right? In verse 4, he says, this one was born there. But in verse 5, he's saying, this one and that one were born in her. And then he says that the Lord will establish her. Listen, he's the one who makes a record of where people are born right? We just went over that list. He knows everything. But it's said more specifically here than it was said before for some reason. And I believe that it's because it's a privilege to be born there. It's a privilege to be born into the family of God. But it's also more personal, isn't it? This would be our personal application from verses 5 and 6. He's not saying they were born there, it's not a plural pronoun used this time. He's not saying that family or that people group. He's saying this one and that one because he knows us as individuals. He knows us every one as individuals. And he's saying it about us. We don't say this about ourselves. We don't say we were born there. He's saying about us. In verse 6, it says that he records as he registers, and I had to look up the difference between those two words. The first one is about counting. Like if you were playing a game and you had a piece of chalk and you need to make a tally mark, like one point for you, one point for me. So he's counting. But he's also registering, like he's writing it down. So he's counting, but he's also writing our names down. Where else have we heard that? That our names are going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want the Lord to say this about me, that I was born there. I want to be counted, and I want my name written in that book. But he counts us because he values us, every single one. He counts us because he has the right to, because he knows everything. He created everything. He counts and he registers so that these people can be regarded as citizens, and registered among his people. And the last reason that he would count is because it's going to be proof to the devil that not one of us was lost or stolen. 
You don't have to turn there, but I'll read from John 17. This is verse 12. Jesus is praying to his father, and he says this. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the son of destruction, that's the devil, that scripture might be fulfilled. So he's counting us and registering us because it's going to be proof to the devil that God always keeps his word that God always does what he says he's going to do. The only difference between records and registers, well, the way I'm differentiating them, the way I'm differentiating them, that's a big sentence, is the difference between citizenship and birthright. Right? Like I was born in the United States of America, I'm a citizen there. And then my birthright gives me certain privileges. I'm a citizen of heaven, which means I get to go to heaven and I get to stay there for an eternity with my Savior. There's going to be a great census of God's church someday. He's going to be reading our names from the Lamb's Book of Life. And don't we want the Lord to say this of us? Don't we want the Lord to say, she was born there? She belongs here? She's one of my daughters? I've given her citizenship in my kingdom. There's going to be a lot of privileges that come with that. Let's look at verse 7. This is what we came to look at, right? Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. I hope I did a good job describing to you how we get to this place. These people who have been God's enemies are singing and dancing and saying, All my springs are in you. These people who are chosen by God, who were his people, are singing and dancing and saying, all my springs are in you. And then all these generations later, you and I are sitting in this chapel in Eldoret, Kenya, singing and dancing and saying, all my springs are in the Lord. This is about the goodness of God. And it describes how blessed people who live in God's city truly are. Singing and dancing refers to some kind of celebration. Maybe I don't have to describe that part to you. Where I'm from, we we sing and we dance when people get married, right? We eat and we drink when people get married. So think of it as a celebration where people might be playing instruments, singing, and dancing. And what are they saying? All my springs are in you. I listened to my pastor teach this, and I was taking notes on everything he said. But he said, it doesn't say here that some of my springs are in the Lord. It says all of them, that everything is cool and quenching and satisfying comes from the Lord. Not some of it, all of it. Everything that's cool and quenching and satisfying comes from the Lord. I read a commentary by David Guzik, and I'll read a quote from that. He said, the goodness of God often comes to us like water from a spring. It seems to bubble up from a hidden secret source. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read to you James 1.17 is the verse I think we that he's referring to every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation due to change. All we are, all we have, and all we hope to be is from him. And if we're people of God, we're going to praise him for it. If we're people of God, this is going to be on the tip of our tongue. This is going to be bursting up from the depths of our soul. It's going to be born of our heart. We're going to be saying, everything I am, everything I hope to be, everything I have came from the Lord. I told you in the very beginning that I read that Charles Spurgeon commentary. So after I did my inductive Bible study... I went back to that commentary, and I understood it much better. (laughs) There's a quote by him that is a real treasure, but he is way smarter than me, 
So if you don't mind, I'll read it twice, and I'm going to read it slowly, because I think it's going to bless somebody in here. So this is what Charles Spurgeon said about this verse. Are you ready? If all my springs are in God, then let all my streams flow to God. All the rivers run into the sea because they came from the sea. It was from the sea that the sun drew up the clouds, which fed a thousand hills, which fall into the river, so the river runs back to the sea. Let us do the same. What we have had from God must go to God. Should I read it again? Okay. If all my springs are in God, then let all my streams flow to God. All the rivers run into the sea because they came from the sea. It was from the sea that the sun drew up the clouds, which fed a thousand hills, which fall into the rivers, and so the rivers run back to the sea. Let us do the same. What we have had from God must go to God. And this is the picture that I want to close with because I'm a science teacher. I was thinking of the water cycle. Anybody been in a science classroom where there's that arrow that goes in a circle? There's water here on the surface of the earth. It evaporates. It condenses into clouds. And then there's some precipitation that brings it back down. I'll say it again using smaller words, just in case. The water goes up, clouds form, and the water comes back down. But it's a physical pattern in the natural world. God established it that way because we need water. We can't live without it. And he has this way of filtering it and recycling it and using it and bringing it back to us every time. That's what that quote by Charles Spurgeon made me think of. And then I realized I don't really know what a spring is, so I looked it up. I'll read this to you. This is just like the first hit off the internet. A natural exit point where the groundwater emerges from the water table and flows onto the surface of the earth. So the water cycle would say it has to go up and then back down. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, instead of evaporating, it just rests on the, surface of, on the surface of the earth, waiting for you and me to come and drink. And if I had a drink of that living water, that kind of water that would make me never thirst again, if I had a drink of that, how would that satisfy my soul? I'm going to say it again because I want to make sure that my words aren't in the way. This water that should have gone in this pattern didn't go. It stayed there. God made a space for it to sit. Now, where I'm from, we find these springs and we put bottles in them and then we sell them in the store. The water is so good, you would want to buy it. But I'm thinking the personal application is God created a space filled with something good for you and for me, and it's just waiting. It's, he's not hiding it from us. He's offering it to us. He wants us to taste it and then shout and dance and sing, all my springs are in you. It's that good. It's supposed to be that good. And Jesus told that woman at the well, if you taste this, you're never going to be thirsty again. But I get thirsty because I sin, because I grieve the Holy Spirit, because I disobey. I'm a cheater, I'm a liar, I'm all these things. Because I'm not perfect, because I don't have God's character, not in perfection. So where do I go when I feel thirsty again? We just sang that song, right? All who are thirsty. Anybody come in here thirsty today? Like I could use a drink of that living water? And it's just waiting there. God made this spring for us. It didn't evaporate. It's not in the clouds. 
It's not hidden under the surface of the earth in the water table. It's ready. It's waiting. I think I'm done anyway. I'll let my notes fall on the ground. Can I pray for you? Because I'm first. I'm not doing an altar call, but I want you to get this before the end of the day, before 4 p.m. I want you to be singing and dancing and crying, shouting, exclaiming, all my springs are in you. So I'm praying that for the music, for the speakers, for everything that happens after this, God would continue to open your heart. He would continue to show you his goodness, and he would give you a reason to celebrate the way we've seen these people did. Amen? God, thank you for your character. Thank you for my friends in Philadelphia who laminated that card. Thank you for these women, their openness to hear the word. I pray you would use it. Use this Bible study, not only today, but later as we sit, we read it again, and we meditate on your word. Be glorified in the rest of what happens today, Lord. Be honored. Let your name be lifted high. Be magnified. But bless these women. Cause them to say that all their springs are in you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Amen.